Okay, y'all have to bear with me. I'm a nervous person. Okay. So, my name is Joy. Hello. Thank you all for coming. There should be, all my friends are late, just like me. So there's just some other people coming in later on. Can you hear me? So, um, so I inadvertently came to pick town. I have, I, my ex-husband is from here. And he's born and raised in Picktown, which is how I came into the area. And this book is basically about some of the experiences that I went here. Not all good, not all, you know, not all bad. It's just the reality of life. And sometimes paths bring you into, you know, things that you don't necessarily plan on being in or didn't, you know, actually see for yourself. You know, and it was all rough times and by the time it was all over, it was like, what the hell? Like even even during, you know, that period of life, it was like, what the hell is going on? And I knew that I wasn't supposed to be there, but seeing as I'm here, okay, I have to maneuver my way out safely. Okay, and we're going to through the situation, and I was, this is the first time, you know, I had heard about things, you know, like things that I experienced while I was here, but I had never, this was my first time, so I'm watching this, and this is everyday life for people in this area. So, one of my friends, when she read the book, she said it was, what she appreciated about it is, this is the first time that she actually got to visit her neighborhood from an outsider's perspective. You know what I mean? Because what goes on in this city happens every day, and they just people just think it's normal, but it's really not, including my part in it. So what the book is about is when my now ex-husband was my boyfriend at the time, and he was arrested for a crime that he didn't commit. And it was everything that I did to make sure that he got a fair trial. The kicker in it is, and I think that this really has you know a lot to do with life is is that there are no good guys in this in the book. Um, this is the only daggone thing that he hadn't done in this neighborhood. Okay? And the police knew he didn't do it and they still locked him up for it. And the prosecutors knew he didn't do it and they kept him locked up. And judges knew he didn't do it and they forced him to go through a trial. And I wasn't any better because I was doing, you know, crazy things to make sure that I could pay for a trial for him. And that's what the book is about. So in the book, I'm not, you know, I don't portray myself as, you know, someone who's a do-gooder and someone who is, you know, justly going out now. That's none of, none of it at all. And when you read the book, you'll see I just lay it out and you can pick to ride with who you want to ride with in it, whether it be the cops, him, you know, the people in the neighborhood, me. It's just a story, you know, that I think the reception that I've had to it is, is that it's gripping and it's compelling it. You take a journey into Big Town. So, with that, I will read you. You ready? Yeah! Right. It says, I was stressed out and business was for shit. I hadn't really recovered from the Donald boss. Antonio and Rick needed money every week, plus my daily expenses, and now I just kicked out $1,000. I was really broke. For days, I stressed about what I should do. Finally, I decided to call my mother back in Atlanta and ask for her advice. She had, uh, she had been home for many years by this time. She served more than nine years in prison. She rebuilt her life and even remarried since being released. She hadn't met Antonio. We've never traveled to Atlanta. He was a heroin addict and couldn't be without heroin, so traveling wasn't an option. She had no idea what was going on with me. We hadn't talked a lot because I didn't want the judgment. Uh, I didn't want the judgment I deserved for being in the situation. I told her the truth, all of it. I told her I know girlfriends always think the boyfriend didn't do it. I told her about Ryan and what the judge said. Well. If the victim told the judge and the prosecutor that Antonio didn't shoot him and they still have him locked up and they have it out for him, she said no, she had no judgment in her voice at all. My advice to you is to get him a great attorney and you need money for that. 
I know you're not making any in Baltimore just because I know Baltimore. So my advice to you is to come back home and do what you do with the people you do it with here and get that money out. You have to do it fast because they're going to take him to court soon and eat. everything has to be in place before them. It was the first time my mother wasn't putting me down. She was talking to me as an intelligent person. I knew she meant it and that only reassured what I'd already known, what I'd already been thinking. I had to go back to Atlanta and get with my old crew and make real money. I didn't want to leave because I didn't want Antonio to feel like I was abandoning him. I was the only person in his family that was keeping him, that was helping him during this time. No one else did anything for him. I would call his mother and give her updates. I was the only one going to visit him every day. I was all he had and I didn't want him to think I was leaving him too. The night after I talked to my mother, I spoke to Antonio, who was now calling me on the house phone at Mickey's. I would just pay for the phone calls Antonio made. I told him about uh, the talk I had with my mother and what decision I came to. He was upset and thought I was going, I was going to, I was going, I wasn't going to come back, sorry. Antonio knew nothing of my life back home in Atlanta. He didn't know the people I know, he didn't know the family I came from. He didn't know the money I made selling weed there. I assured him that I wasn't going to abandon him. I was strictly going back to make money for his defense and I'd be back before he went to court. He didn't believe me. I could hear it in his voice. I knew the only way to prove it to him was to show him. Nothing I said was going to convince him. I made all the arrangements I needed before leaving. I, contact, I collected all the money I had in the streets from those that were selling for me. I went to Stan and arranged for him to three-way Antonio's calls to my cell phone. To my surprise, Stan informed me that he had a second line in the house. None of the people in the house knew about it because there was no phone connected to the jack. He agreed to put the phone in the jack solely for the purpose of transferring the calls to my phone so Antonio could call me directly. I gave him 50 bucks for the favor. The day I was returning to Atlanta, I had an evening flight. I was in the neighborhood hanging out and I ran into Ryan, who was out of hiding for that day. He wanted to go to Foul Ball, which was the bar he was shot at. I told him I couldn't get a drink because I was on my way to a junkie's house who owed me $20. I wasn't pressed about the money. It was the principal. This was an older white man who owed me money. He was ill and I gave him two pills because he got a government check the next day. He assured me I was more than welcome to come by his house and get my money. We had done it before, but it was the first time he was ducking me. Ryan walked with me to the guy's house. As usual, his girlfriend answered the door to tell me he wasn't there. I was cordial to her. After all, she didn't know me a thing. I told her to let him know I was leaving town and I'd be back before I left. Ryan was waiting for me at the bottom of the steps of the row house. She watched me as I left and saw Ryan. He and I stepped into the street and started walking toward Foul Ball when she called out to me, J.O., hey. Ryan and I both turned around to look at her. She was speaking to me, but looking at him when she asked me. Rob owes you money, doesn't he? She never took her eyes off of Ryan. I took advantage of that and said, yeah, right now he does, but in an hour, he's going to owe him money. Ryan jumped in the conversation and said, he sure is. The tall, pretty black woman had a look of fear on her face, never taking her eyes off of Ryan. She said, hold on a minute, and went back to the house, shutting the door behind her. I looked at Ryan, trying to figure out what was going on. He had a smirk on his face and a bit of a fire in his eye. Before I could ask him what was what was all, uh, what that was all about, the woman opened up the door and said, here, holding out a small wad of money. I walked back to the house, climbed the steps, and took the money. It was all there. She said, still looking at Ryan, I don't know what you do to him about your money, but I know what he'll do. She was afraid. I looked at Ryan as I walked down the steps. He was ear to ear grinning, chip tooth and full view, looking like a badass little boy with a goatee, nodding his head, acknowledging her fear and giving her reason to have it. I just laughed and told him, come on. We walked to Foul Ball. I gave Ryan the money I got from the woman and bought him a beer. We had a good laugh off of that. I looked at Ryan as a little boy, not in a physical sense, but in a cute young guy sense. He was cute and slim. He was always laughing and smiling, being playful and silly when we hung out. He always called me Big Sis. He was so cute, he couldn't be mean. At least that's what I thought. I now know better. 
I should have known better all along. We have the same issue, being mixed kids in a black environment. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, so now what? <laughs> Can we start drinking? Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about anything? I just want to finish reading a book. <laughs> so what was the time period? Yeah. This was, um, it started Father's Day 2003. Okay. And then... It ended late February, excuse me, 2004. That was the whole um, time period of the trial and everything. And he's back, he's here, running around here somewhere. He might float in here tonight. <laughs> Actually, there's a few people in the book that might float in and out of here tonight. Oh, which yeah. was, yeah, but they're all cool. Everybody's grown and yeah. diverse, so. But yeah, that's the whole thing is that, you know, for me, the reason why I have the smoke in my face on the book is because even though this is my story, I'm not her anymore. So I didn't want people to see my face on the book and then say, oh yeah, you're J.O. That's no, what that's I said. That's who I was. Matter of fact, you was here. Yeah, I think. They said, why her smoke, why her smoke in her face? Yeah, that's why. Yeah, and I said, she probably just don't want to be noticed or crack. It's crack. No. Oh, okay. no, I mean, no. I mean, I had to no. say either or. No. But I get it. Yeah. Right. Oh, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that was the whole reason was it's just, it's my story. It's just, yeah, I'm not yeah. there anymore. So right. I just don't want the confusion of Yeah. Because yeah. I've had people who see me after the book and they're like, can I call you J.O.? Like, no, you can't. Well, I mean, this is the yeah, first yeah. time meeting you and I really didn't expect this like petite, demure looking woman. You Who's were, like, petite? Gorgeous. You, Thanks, I see. She's gorgeous. <laughs> and like being a girl, you just don't really, you know, picture these things. Right. Yeah. yeah. And you know what's funny is that all the cops in the neighborhood used to say, you know what? You know why everybody knows who you are? Because you stick out like a sore thumb around here. And, it's like, and when I first started coming around here, they thought I was a cop. I would walk into like, let's say there was fast pizza up the block, I'd walk in and get a slice of pizza and you'd hear, phone off the hook, and that meant police were in there, it was me. <laughs> the whole time. The whole time, I didn't know. I didn't know, I, I was so green when I came around yeah. here, I didn't talk to anybody for three months, because I didn't want them to know that I didn't know anything, I had never seen anything like this, yeah, you know what I mean? Different. Yeah, it's completely different, yes. but at the same time, you know, this area is such a tight community and it's so close and everybody loves each other. You know what I mean? And that's what I love about this neighborhood and I'm always going to love this neighborhood and the people that are in it because they took me in as family when I was a complete stranger mm -hmm. based on who I was with and the fact that I wasn't a jerk. You know what I mean? And I treated everyone with respect and I took it, you know, I always took it to heart and I was always very conscious of this is their neighborhood, not mine. Yeah. This is where they live. And so when there was always conflict in the neighborhood, whether it be among the girls or among the guys, I was always neutral and, you know, I was always friends with everybody because there's no reason for me not to be, you know what I mean? No matter who my boyfriend was at the time. And then when he came back and, you know, because before he left, nobody was allowed to talk to me unless he introduced you to me. And then by the time he came back, like everybody in the neighborhood is walking by, like, hey, Joy, what's up? And he's just like looking, like, oh, really? And I was like, yeah, it's my neighborhood now. He's like, oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, it was fun. And then we had a summer here, and it was like summer in New York in the 70s. It's like 20 million kids out in the street having fun, and it was just, yeah, it was just great. It was community. You know, no matter what the ups and downs were, when somebody was up, Everybody was happy for him, but when somebody was down, everybody was like pushing, you know, and trying to help him. And it's like, it's just a very strong sense of community down here. And I haven't really seen that in a lot of other places. You don't really see that in Atlanta as much as the way that you see it. You know, people grow up together, and in Atlanta, it's more like, you know, you see each other and you click up, but here, everybody lives together, you know. And people in this, people in this neighborhood have been here generations, so it's a completely different you know, element, it's more like New York neighborhoods, mm -hmm. where, you know, like where my grandmother lived in New York, she was there, what, 50, 60 years? 
in the same neighborhood. Yeah. So I've known people my whole life from when I was a teenager, grown people would come up to me and go, oh, you're such and such as kid. You know, and it's the same way here, and I've always, you know, endeared myself to that. No matter what the flaws of, of everybody was, it's like I got flaws too, and I couldn't judge anybody, you know, because I wasn't doing any better myself. I was just on the opposite end of it, so. And it all worked out. You know, I have good relationships here. I come back, I visit, you know, I've moved on, but I still have my family here and my community here that I met here. And hopefully they'll be here with me. <laughs> what inspired you to write the book? So, I've always wanted to be a writer. Um, when I was a little girl, I had dreams of, I used to watch a lot of Taxi, the television show Taxi, so in my mind, I was going to be a taxi driver, I was going to NYU, and I was going to be an author. I always knew that. And then, as, you know, life goes on, you know, you're under your parents' roof, and, and my childhood was tumultuous my whole life. It was very unstable. It was very volatile. You know, it was just a very dangerous place for children to be in and a neglectful environment. And so when you're, there's an old saying, you can't tell a hungry man about God because all he hears is his stomach growling. So as a child, I had to learn to survive. And I was always in survival mode and, and flight and fight mode. Um, fight or flight mode. So it kind of drowned out what I wanted. But it was like for my entire life, I always knew that I would write it. And I always saw myself writing a book. But I didn't know what it was going to be. I didn't know, you know, what the pages were going to be. And all of my friends were telling me to write about my childhood. I don't want to write about my childhood. I haven't, I'm still coming to terms with my childhood. And that's mainly because it's easier for me to accept my guilt and my responsibility for the things that I've done to myself and to others. It's easier for me to apologize to that than to deal with what was done to me and having not received acknowledgement or apologies for that. So when I do write that book, I don't want it to come from a place of anger. I want it to come from the same place that this book came from, which is a place of settle. So in saying that, um, Antonio, the character in the book, told me about a friend of his who was incarcerated who wrote a book. And the author had received $70,000 for the book. So he was like, and, and Antonio at the time was incarcerated. So he asked me, he was like, you should write a book. And I had a flip answer. I was like, shit, you got all day, why don't you write a book? And he was like, yeah, but I can't write. You can and it made sense, and then my defenses came down, and we were talking about it, and I was like, yeah, but what would I write? And literally within five minutes of trying to think about what would I write, this story came into my head. Literally, the beginning, the middle, and the end, just straight into my head. Mm. And I looked at him, I mean, I was a girl on the phone, and I said, yeah, I know the story. And he was like, which one are you going to do? He's like, what are you going to write? And I said, about you getting arrested for shooting, right which is Bradford is his real name. So I said, I'm going to write that story. And he was like, yeah, and he didn't have any, you know, clue as to how I was going to write it. And that night, I, st I sat down and I started writing it. And then, like, it literally took me 15 weeks to write the book. And then from there, it was a matter of just editing and all of, you know, those types of things. And then that was the book. What do you hope for people to come out of when they read this book? I think, I think what I want for people to come out of the book is they had an adventure. It was, what I want to do when I read a book is I want to escape. You know, that's the purpose of a book, to me. I want to escape, I want to go into that world, I want to be, you know, taken in and engulfed by that world, and that's what I want for people to You got a question? <laughs> That's my friend Dan. Can you hear me? She can hear me. <laughs> what changes do you see in Pig Town? Oh, I see a lot of changes in Pig Town. Um, one, I see the construction has, you know, the gentrification, people are coming in and cleaning it up. Um, it's a lot more calmer. 
what I've been through here. It's a lot calmer than when I was here. Um, a lot of the same people uh, are here. Like I said, the families have been here for generations. Um, I think what I miss about it is all the kids in the street. You know, I haven't seen many kids in the street the few times that I've come back here. There are always kids in the street. Um, the flip side of that is that the kids that I used to see in the street are now adults, and a few of them have been killed and died since then. I think that that's heartbreaking and sad, you know, that, that's, that that goes on. But, yeah, just the fact that it's a lot nicer, it's a lot cleaner, and it's a lot quieter, yeah, those are the differences there. How do you think uh, the legalization of marijuana would have... <laughs> <laughs> I know, I get it. But no, I like that if, question. If it, if it was, things were a little different, I guess, in terms of, uh, you know. I don't think marijuana is the issue okay. in the city. The issue no, is not, not marijuana. No, no. Now, the difference is that I, marijuana is what I did, is right. what I sold in Atlanta. Oh, Here, Atlanta. it was a different ballgame. Yeah. Yeah. Here, it was a completely different well, commodity. Like, like, it was heroin. Yeah. It was heroin and cocaine. Right. It was yeah. what I was doing okay. here. And I think for, you know, from with being bipolar, being from Atlanta, you know, and being in Baltimore, they're two completely different things. The story I like to tell is that when I, when I was here and I was dating Antonio, I used to always complain. I'd be, every time we were in a car someplace going somewhere, I'm always talking about how beat up the streets are and how dirty the streets are. And, you know, and I'm cursing. I'm like, yeah, some streets just jacked up. They don't... The so streets are dirty, there's trash in the streets, the streets are ripped up, they're still in the mud. And he didn't know any difference, so he used to always be like, eh, shut up. And then he came to Atlanta with me, and we were there literally about 20 minutes, and he said, there's no trash in the streets. And I said, no. And he said, there's no, the streets aren't broken up and bumpy. And I said, no. And then it hit him why I've been saying that the whole time. And in, you know, you come to, you, come, you hear about, like, I, I watch the news when I'm in Atlanta and I see the news that's here, okay? And, for instance, I see the news with Freddie Gray. And I watch that and I'm looking at it and I'm going, I know exactly why they're rioting. They have, and you know what I mean? I see exactly why they're rioting. And then you come to Atlanta and, you know, if, you, if a cop shoots somebody, and it's unjust. They don't just fire them on the spot. You check the record. They do not play. They charge police with murders. They charge police with death of people. And so that's the difference in watching a black city one way and a black yeah. city another way. But I've been to Atlanta and the, the black uh, population, they have money. It's like well to do black people in Baltimore, not as much. Exactly. A lower income situation. Exactly. You know, where you the money talks and everything else doesn't. So Exactly. Yeah. And one of the things that I used to hear about here, which was always, you know, um, concerning to me, was I've never met um, okay, so these are the things that I that I had heard about I don't know. Um, I didn't experience it myself. These were just things that people would say. And you know, in Baltimore, if you have an addiction to drugs and you decide to go on meth, you know, on the methadone program, two things about that. One, they'll give you an apartment and a check. And two, they don't take you off the methadone. So if you want to phase off of it, they don't, they don't allow you to do that. Well, to me, that's no different than being out the street on it. You just don't go, you're just a government drug addict at this point as opposed to selling it from somebody like, you know, buying it from somebody like me. To me, there was no difference there. So that was one of the things that was disheartening to me. Two, if a person is trying, if people are trying to better themselves, and I, you know, getting off of heroin and using methadone as a way to slip off of it, and you don't allow them to, then that's cockholding someone, okay? And, and here it's cockholding an entire community, you know what I mean, or, or an entire city. Um, the other thing that I heard is, is that if you're bipolar, they give you a job, they give you a, they give you a check in an apartment, okay? If you're illiterate, they give you a check. It's like for, instead of helping you, putting you into therapy to deal with whatever the issue is that puts you, that made you want to go to heroin. My philosophy is, 
you get high or drunk for one of two reasons. You're either celebrating or you're drowning something. Okay? And if you're getting high and drunk every day, then you're probably not celebrating something. So there is an issue there. And if you don't have some sort of a way, whether it be through the arts, writing, drawing, singing, rapping, creating something to channel that. And as a community, we don't really look into therapy that much. So that would, and I'm big into therapy. I went through a lot, a lot of therapy to walk away from the things that I did to myself and the things that were done to me to get past that. So what I've seen here is, is that there is, it's the, the government here, I don't want to say it's the government, but it is the government, but the way things run here is, you know, we'll give you something now to keep you settled so that you don't want to go for something else, something bigger. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's the way, that's the way as an outsider I've seen it. Because, you know, like you said, in Atlanta it's black owned, black governed, black policed, and we pump out educated black people all day long. We've got a whole university system there designed just for that. You know, whatever your gender, you know, whatever your orientation, there's an education system that looks just like you there. So it is it is a very, you know, large difference. And but in Atlanta, yeah, if you're on drugs, you can get yourself off. You know, there's plenty of stuff out there to do it, but yeah, we're not gonna give you a check for that. You know what I mean? We're not giving you a check for that. We're not, if, you're, if you want to get off the drugs and there's, I don't even know if there is a methadone program, but if there is one, it's, when you're ready to get off of it, they're getting you off of it, and that's the way it is. It's more of a, all right, we can stabilize you, but, you know, this is a city of, get it on your own, and there's really no excuse, so that's the way it is, and like, you know, the people that I grew up with, you know, what I was doing was looked down on. Nobody was like, oh yeah, that shit is cool, no. It's like, what are you doing? You know, so I was always away from my friends. I was the only one of my friends that actually did anything illegal. Everybody else well, has jobs and, you know what I mean, does other stuff. But, yeah, my people that I grew up with, and it was because of my childhood and the fact that my mother went to prison, you know, when I was still a kid and I had to figure it out on my own. You know, all my other friends are, like, in the government, in Atlanta, and, you know, own businesses or... Yeah, in banking and all of that stuff, and then there's me. So, like, how do you, like, did you feel like you had to choose between being black or white? Because you said you're biracial? Yeah, I'm not. I'm half Puerto Rican and half Christian. Oh. So it's black and white people with accents is what it really just, <laughs> it really just boils down to. And the answer to that is no. When I was, when I was a kid, I didn't know it. Somebody, I heard my mother having a conversation and that's how I found out I was mixed. Because as a mixed kid, you don't know because it's your nature. You don't, you don't realize that your parents are different colors until somebody points it out to you. So for me, my father is, my father uh, was in the Nation of Islam. And when I was a kid, he used, you know, it was the whole, you're black thing. But my brother was like, okay, and for me it was a little bit different. You know, with me it was, well, how can that be because I look like my mother? It, does that make sense? So I always fought with that, but then society told me that I am black. And then, but I was also raised in a very militant black family. So that was also, you know, all of that was inside of me. And then finally I came to the conclusion of one, I did a little history. And I realized that the one drop rule is a slave rule. It was designed to prevent children of slave owners from receiving freedom and inheritance. So nobody defines me according to that. I define myself. In order for someone to say that I'm black, it's telling me that my mother doesn't count. So I have a feeling about that. I am a biological fence strangler, is the way that I look at it. So and in, in my life experience, what I found out is, is that what I've experienced is that when white people see me, okay, it is it's human nature to it's human nature to look for a common ground, something that makes you feel comfortable. Okay, mm -hmm. so when white people see me, the 
first thing that they notice is the light. And then after they get comfortable, they say, oh, skin's a little browner and the hair's a little curly. Okay, once you're comfortable. When black people see me, the first thing they see is brown. And then after you get comfortable, you say, oh, but her hair's a little curlier and her skin's a little lighter. So it's that balance there. Uh, when my hair's straight, you really can't tell what the hell.